All right, we're going to begin really quickly by talking about unit conversion. Um, and as we do that, the things that we need to keep in mind as important are our metric prefixes. So we're going to have nano, which is 10 to the negative ninth. We're going to have micro, which is 10 to the negative sixth. We're going to have milli, which is 10 to the negative third. We have centi, which is 10 to the negative 2. Those are the things that are smaller than a meter, smaller than our base unit. And then we're going to have kilo, which is 10 to the third. It's a thousand. Mega, which is 10 to the sixth, which is a million. And giga, which is 10 to the ninth, which is a billion. And these things are larger than our base unit. A kilometer is longer than a meter. <clears throat> so keep these in mind and then we'll do a really quick example. Uh, let's say we have 10 meters and we want to find out um, how many nanometers that is. We have to take that and multiply it by our conversion factor. That's what all this stuff over here on the side is. These conversion factors tell me what to do. Well, I need a meter on the bottom and a nanometer on the top. That way my units come out, right? Meters cross out. It leaves me with nanometers. Now, this is my conversion factor. One nanometer is 10 to the negative ninth meters. So I'm going to take 10, divide it by 10 to the negative ninth, and that's going to give me... Uh, 10 to the neg I'm sorry, 10 to the positive 10 nanometers. There are a whole lot of nanometers in one meter. And that's why I, I, I want to emphasize this smaller and larger thing. By looking at what's smaller and larger, we'll be able to sort of mentally check our answers to make sure that everything's okay. Now, in physics, We, we are very concerned with staying in the MKS system. The MKS system is meters, kilograms, and seconds. Every unit that we use is going to be com a combination of meters, kilograms, and seconds. Um, even when we look at, well, at least this is for everything this semester, when we look at a Newton, a Newton is a kilogram times a meter divided by seconds squared. It's, it's a complicated unit that's still composed of just these three things. So that is what we are after uh, as far as unit conversion goes. That's, that's not a whole lot of stuff to deal with. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at is motion graphs. And so we're going to have our, our three motion graphs. Position versus time. Velocity versus time. And acceleration versus time. Now good news, we're in AP Physics. That means we're going to get to deal with accelerations that do change over time. We're just not going to do that yet. Now. We're going to look at some basic graph shapes to see how everything works together, and we're going to start with acceleration. So let's say the red line represents what we get when we have positive acceleration. When we have positive acceleration, one of the things that that means for velocity versus time, or one of the rules that we're going to need to keep in mind, is that the slope of that graph is equal to acceleration. So if I have positive acceleration, that means the slope of my velocity versus time graph is going to have to be positive. Now those are two different cases of what we can have for positive acceleration. And they're two very different and very tricky things to deal with. What we see with this graph right here is that we are moving in the forward direction. We have a positive velocity and it is increasing. It's speeding up. 
the value of velocity is getting more and more and more positive. So it's positive getting more positive. Here, on the other hand, it's, it's different. It's strange. It's harder to deal with. Looking at that, we have a negative velocity. And the magnitude, the size of the velocity, is getting smaller. We are moving backwards and slowing down. In each case, we're going to have still that same positive acceleration. Now, um, these are going to look very different when we look at position versus time. Looking at position versus time, if we start off with a positive acceleration, we'll look at this top one first, um, we will accelerate forward and our position will increase. We're moving in the positive direction and, and the velocity is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Another thing to look at here is that the slope... of position versus time is velocity. Now, down here, looking at this one, we start off moving very quickly backwards and we slow down. Now, the thing that these two have in common is that they are both concave up. That's what we expect to see with positive acceleration. The reason I'm moving quickly through this is because it should be a review of what we did last year. So we're gonna shrink this put it out to the side. And now we're going to look at the case of negative acceleration. So for acceleration versus time, we're going to look at negative acceleration. All this means is that our acceleration is not in the same direction that it was before. So looking at velocity versus time, we said the slope of velocity versus time was acceleration. Uh, another way to represent that is that acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot in calculus terms yet um, until maybe, I think, our third unit, just to allow everybody who's in AB calculus to catch up with everybody who's in BC calculus and knows what things are. But for future reference, acceleration is the derivative of velocity uh, with respect to time. Looking at, um, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, looking at the backward side of that, we could also say that uh, velocity, or the change in velocity rather, is the integral of acceleration with respect to time. Now, if you don't know what that bottom part is yet, don't worry. We will get to it, and we will spend time with it. It's just going to be a while. Back to the graph shapes. Looking at this, um, if my acceleration is negative, and my acceleration tells me about the slope of velocity versus time, then what we're going to see is a velocity versus time with a negative slope. Now, those, those two things are very different. For the first one, let's go back to blue. For the first one, um, I have a positive velocity. I'm moving in the forward direction, but the size of my velocity, the speed, the magnitude of my velocity is slowing down. This is like driving in a car with the brakes on. For the second one, I have a negative velocity, but the magnitude of that velocity is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I've now thrown the car into reverse and I'm heading backwards, speeding up, going in reverse. That's kind of what that is. And then if we take and look at that for position versus time, uh, for the blue one, the first one, where we have a positive velocity, we're moving forward but we're slowing down, we have to move forward but we're slowing down. And again here, the slope of this line is the velocity. So if the velocity is high at the beginning, right here, that means I have to have a very steep slope at the beginning. And the velocity dies down, gets closer to zero, well the slope here dies down and gets closer to zero. Uh, what we're going to say about this is that velocity is the change in position over the change in time. And if we wanted to, we could say the same thing about the derivative. It's the derivative of position with respect to time. And we won't write that integral relationship just yet. 
looking at this bottom one where, where we still have a negative acceleration, but we're moving in the backwards direction, we're going to have to move in the backwards direction. And this says that the magnitude of my velocity is small, so my slope is small, and it increases as we go on. And looking at both of those, what we're seeing is uh, negative concavity. They're, they're parts of a, a frown. That's how you know you have negative acceleration. Positive acceleration, you get a smile. Negative acceleration, you get a frown. So we'll park all of that over here. It's very hard to read. Um, now we're going to look at our kinematic equations. These are the things that we're going to use for the first uh, little bit of class to do some problems with. And right now we're just looking at kinematics in um, one dimension. So, as, as these equations appear on the AP equation sheet, we have our first one, V equals V0 plus AT. Our second one, V squared equals V0 squared plus 2A delta X and delta X equals V0T plus 1 half at squared. These are our three kinematic equations. I will refer to them, probably to you annoyingly, as the big three. <clears throat> so, V0 is for initial velocity. V is final velocity. Acceleration is an A. It's a very convenient one. T is for time. And delta X is for our change in position. Well, we spent a whole lot of time on this last year. We spent six weeks talking about kinematics, whether it was one-dimensional or two-dimensional. This year we're going to spend exactly a week on it. Well, okay, a week and a day. We're going to have a quiz... Um, next week over this stuff. Now I'm not going to spend the same amount of time on it this year because I expect you to know it and I expect you to be able to solve problems with this stuff in there. Park that over there. Um, this is when we look at word problems and try to pick out what our initial velocity is, what our final velocity is, what our acceleration is, what our time is. You get to choose which equation you're going to use based on the information that you have. Now, if it's not a free-fall problem, you're going to find your acceleration first, then use stuff. If it is a free-fall problem, there are some things that we have to remember. First off, in free-fall, our acceleration is equal to g, which is 10 meters per second squared down. That's an acceleration, meters per second squared, in the downward direction. When you throw a ball up, it's slowing down the whole time. Now, when you throw a ball up into the air... Let's imagine we just throw that thing straight up. At the very top, the velocity is instantaneously zero. It stops. It slows down, comes to a stop, turns around, and comes back down. The important thing to remember about this top position is that the acceleration is still equal to the acceleration due to gravity. If it had zero acceleration at the stop, at the top, it would mean that the velocity wasn't changing at the top and the ball would just hang out. We don't see the ball just hanging out, we see the ball dropping back down after it gets to the top. The velocity is still continuously changing. At all points along the way, this is experiencing a constant acceleration of 10 meters per second squared down. And when we do things in lab, we will use the actual value of 9.8 meters per second squared. But when we're working problems, 10 is a lot easier of a number to deal with. Now, we will talk about some of the particulars of, of projectiles and, and just throwing a ball up with constant acceleration due to gravity later. Uh, but for now, this is all that we're going to talk about. Tomorrow, we're going to look at some of these problems. Uh, and tomorrow, we'll move on to vectors and things like that for our video. So that's our first one.